Alright, so yesterday we did uh, 1.3 part 2. We went through projectile, motion, piecewise functions. Uh, and today we're going to look at 1.4. If there's stuff you already know, you don't necessarily have to write it down. Uh, I'll put it on the board, but I'm going to go through it kind of quick. So in 1.4 we talk about drawing linear functions, so lines. Uh, the most common formula we use for drawing a line is y equals mx plus b, uh, where m is your slope and b is your y-intercept. Any question on that? What's the y-intercept again? That's where your line crosses the y-axis. Yep. Uh, that's saying the same thing again. So basically, anything that you can write in the form y equals mx plus b is linear. So if you had something like 2y equals 4x plus 10, you might say, well, that's not y equals mx plus b. No, but it could be. Yeah? You would have to divide all of it by 2, yeah. which would get you 1 equals 2x plus 5. Right. As long as you can arrange it somehow to be in y equals mx plus b, then it is a even if it has something like 3x plus 6y equals 4, that would have even a little more work to do. But you could bring the 3x to the other side and then divide by 6. So anything that can be written in that form is a line. And remember, uh, the y-intercept can be any number you want. And the slope can generally be any number except 0. Because if you make the slope 0, then it's what we call a constant function. That's when you would get something like y equals 10. It's a line, but it's a horizontal line. We call that a constant function in our book, not a linear function. Um, you could kind of debate that a little bit, but y equals mx plus b is what's important. Um, so slope. Um, what's the formula for slope? y equals mx plus b. So specifically, what's the m? How do you find the m in y equals mx plus b? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, rise <laughs> over run. Rise over run. Yep, yep. Y2 minus y1 equals x2 over, no, minus x1. Yeah, so if you're going to do slope, um, you can think of it as rise over run. I think I write that down. If I don't. So the rise is the difference in the y's, y2 minus y1, and the run is x2 minus x1. Now there are two special cases for slope. What's the slope of a horizontal line? Yeah, zero. What's the slope of a vertical line? Yep, undefined, perfect. Okay, so those are two special cases, and when you write the equation of a horizontal and vertical line, they have a special format. They're not y equals mx plus b. Okay, they're special cases. So when you want to write the equation of a horizontal line, we can do that on the calculator. It's y equals, and then you put in a number. If you want to write an equation of a vertical line, it's x equals and then put in excuse me, a number. So, you can't do vertical on the calculator. Can't draw it. Yeah. Yeah, can't do it. You can only do horizontal. OK, so what would be, um, if you had the point 2, 3, what would be the equation of the horizontal line that goes through the point 2, 3. What? Oh, oh sorry, horizontal. It has to be horizontal and it has to go through the point 2, 3. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it has to be y equals 3. That would be this line right here. Now, what would be the equation of the vertical line that goes through the point 2, 3? Zach? 
it would have to be x equals 2, and that would look like that. Questions on that? On the calculator? Not really, no. I could simulate one, but it would be like a, uh, basically just turning on pixels in a straight line. It wouldn't be an equation. Yeah, you can draw it, but you can't really graph it in y equals format because it's not y equals. Um, so this I kind of already talked about. Let's, let's look at it again. Um, how would you get y by itself in that 2x plus 3y equals 6? Uh, it'd be two steps. Yep. You want me to do both? Sure. Uh, you subtract the 2x both sides and then divide the 2. Subtract the 2x from both sides. Yep. And then you said do what? Divide by 3 all around. No. And you could simplify that 6 divided by 3 to 2. And the, what's the advantage to doing it this way compared to doing it this way? What, what can you see in the y equals mx plus b format right away that you can't? Yeah, you can see the slope and... Yeah. You can see the initial, the y initial. Yeah, the y intersect. Yeah. Yep, you can see exactly these two things that you would need to graph it. Not that you can't graph it the other way, you can. Uh, but we like y equals mx plus b. So there is another form um, for a line. It's called point slope. And if I said to you, find an equation of a line that goes through the point 3, 5 and has a slope of 1 half, that's where this comes in handy. Because you can plug in the coordinate I give you right there. I don't remember what I said. Uh, 3, 5. 3, 5. And then slope of plug in the one half right there. Uh, and if they are okay with you leaving the answer in point slope, you're done. So that's y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Uh, I use the y equals mx plus b more, but you, you can use this. So let's label these three numbers and see where they would go. Um, what's the one half? That's gonna be my, yeah. That's my slope. And the negative 2 is my x1. It's my x1. And the 3? Y1. Y1. Okay, fill them in. Just be careful when you fill in a negative. It's going to see what happens. So we got y minus y1 equals m times x. And now it's going to be x minus negative 2. So it's just going to be a plus 2. That's point slope. Now if they want it rewritten so y is by itself, you can do that. You would have to uh, distribute out the 1 half x. So you get 1 half x, and that would be a plus 1. And then you would have to add 3. So both of those answers are correct. It's just a matter of what format they want. Any questions on finding an equation in point slope? Okay. Uh, parallel and perpendicular lines. Well, if two lines have the same slope and a different y-intercept, they're parallel. Why do I say different y-intercept? What if they just have the same slope, same intercept? Yeah? Uh, it would be the same line. Yeah, that would be the same line. Those aren't parallel. So you got to have the same slope, different y-intercept. Does anybody remember what the slopes are for perpendicular lines? Cool. Uh, a perpendicular line, say if you had three and three or four, you would, you would flip, you put the four on the top and they get it. Yeah. So you flip it. Maybe this, that's the exact example that you have on that. Oh, is it? Yes. Is it the exact one I do? Okay, I'll have to Parallel see what yes. So two lines are perpendicular if their slopes are opposite reciprocals. So two thirds, if you were look, <coughs> excuse me, looking for a line that's perpendicular, it's going to be negative three over two. Flip it. And make it the opposite. OK, 
Okay, so let's try this one. So you'll probably have some kind of problem on the test where I say find a line parallel or perpendicular, and then I'll give you some info. So I want to be parallel to that. If I want to find a line that's parallel to what's in that box, what do I need to know about the 3x minus 2y equals 1? I need to know the what? That line, yes. Yeah. I need to know the slope. So I'm going to find the slope uh, quickly by first moving the 3x to the other side. I didn't really do that in a great order, but it's, it's fine. I'm just trying to find the slope. And I know I'm looking for the number that's next to x. And then I would divide by what? Negative 2. So there's my slope. Not nicely written, but I've got my slope. 3 over 2. Any question on that? Okay, so I've got the slope. I've got my x1. I've got my y1. This problem lends itself to using point slope form. Fill all those values in, just like we filled them in on this last problem, except now it's different numbers. So any questions on how you fill those values into point slope and write the equation on the line? How about change it to y equals mx plus b if they asked you to do that? Good? Okay. So, yeah, no question on how to do it? Okay. I'll leave that for you guys then. Last thing, uh, linear inequalities. So when you're drawing a linear inequality, this is where you usually like shade above, shade below kind of thing. Solid line, dotted line. This chart pretty much explains everything you need to know. To graph a linear inequality, the first thing you do is you graph the line itself. If the original problem has a less than or equal to or a greater than or equal to, you make it a solid line. If it has a less than or a greater than, we're going to make it a dashed or a dotted line. Then we have to decide whether we shade above or shade below. Less thans are always shaded below. Greater thans are always shaded above. Now, that works fine except if you draw a vertical line. Because what's above and what's below there? I mean, you really don't have an above and a below. If you have a vertical line, which way do you think would be below? To the left or to the right? Yep. To the left. To the left. Think about like negative numbers go to the left. That would be below. Above would be to the right. That's the only special case. Okay, let's try, uh, let's try an example. So the first step is to graph the line. I'm probably going to want to rewrite that in y equals mx plus b if I want to graph the line. So let's do that. This time when I rewrote it, I did put it in a better order. I put the x term first. So I would subtract it and get negative 2x. And what would be my last step to get y by itself? Yes, yeah, exactly. divide by three. Mm, it's kind of a lousy y intercept, but it is what it is. Yeah. So my y intercept is one and a third. So right about there. And from that dot, what direction do I go based on the slope to get to the next dot? Yeah. Down two. So, so we're going to go down two, and then we're going to go. Oh yeah, so we're going to go down two units, and then over three units. Yeah. Yep. Sorry about that. So down two, one, two, and then over one, two, three. 
I'll do it again. Down two over three. Yeah, that's good enough. Um, would this be a solid line or a dotted line? Yep. This one would be a dotted line. Yep. So it's going to be a dotted line. Uh, that's not that great. Let me fix it. Okay, good enough. And would we shade below or shade above? Yeah, this is a less than, so we're going to shade below. You don't have to color it perfect. On edge elastic, what you would do is you would click, and it would shade everything on whatever side you click. That's how that works. So the two X, uh, mm -hmm. how do you graph the two? I used to slope intercept. I'm not used to the other system. This is slope intercept. That's what I used. Uh, oh, you converted it. Okay. So I did four thirds, so that's one and a third. And then I went down two, right three. And I did it a couple times. You can go the other way. You could go up two and left three. Um, so you can kind of go either way. Okay. I usually do it twice, or sometimes I even do it three times just to get a few points. Okay. On edge elastic, I'm going to make it easier. I'm not going to give you a number that would have a fraction y intercept. It's probably going to be a nice, like, whole number. Yeah. Any question on that? So I know that was really quick, but I'm hoping that that was all reviewed. Mostly. Okay. All right, so section 1.5 uh, is on what we call transformations and functions. Okay? So... A transformation is when you like shift something left, right, up, or down, or you reflect something, or you stretch something, stretch or compress, up and down, left and right. So we're going to be focusing on specifically quadratic functions, so shifting, stretching, parabolas, but these really apply to any type of function. And we're going to study transformations on every function we study all year, quadratics, Rational, radical, logarithmic, trig functions, um, exponential functions, and they all work the same way. So once we learn them once, we can apply them to everything we do all year. So this is the general form of a quadratic. The a to b in the c can be any, remember we talked about that symbol, that's a real number. It can be any real number you want, except a can't be zero. Um, what would happen if a was zero? Yep. It would be a linear function, exactly. that, not a quadratic. Exactly. If you make a zero, you just wipe out the quadratic term. Now you're down to linear. So if it's going to be quadratic, a can't be zero. So let's graph y equals x squared. Um, use nothing crazy here. You can graph it if you want, or you can just what watch. What are symbols that would be a, b, and c? What's that? What are those root symbols of A, B, and C? It means A, B, and C are real numbers. Oh. It, if you want to translate it word for word, A, B, and C are elements of the real number set, meaning positives, negatives, fractions, or decimals, or zero, except for A. Yeah? Are those the ones we're doing tonight, or is that everything was on the board? No, I'm going to write down. I'll write down at the end what, what you have to do. That's just for me to remember to write down what you have to do. Um, so if you graph y equals x squared, you can graph that in a standard window. Zoom 6. And that looks fine. So that's, um, what kind of shape is that again? Cool. Um, so that particular shape has a little different name. Because it's a quadratic. Yeah? It's a parabola. So, yeah, it is curved, but we specifically call it a parabola. Now, what I want to do is graph f of x. And now let me replace x with negative x and see what happens. So, let's replace x with negative x and hit graph. 
How does that graph compare to the first one I drew? Yeah, Jake. Uh, yeah, it's the same thing. So because those two graphs are the same, if you can replace the variable with the negative of that variable, it means that the y-axis is a line of symmetry. And for a parabola, not shifted or stretched in any way, the y-axis is a line of symmetry for it. Um, what do you call the lowest point? It can be the highest point, but in this parabola, it's the lowest. We call that, yeah. Yeah. Yep, that's the vertex. Uh, as I said, it can be the highest point if you flip the parabola over. Okay, so nothing new there. You probably already knew what a vertex was. Questions on that? So now, I want to graph a few different parabolas, and my goal here is to figure out what does changing the number in front of x squared do. So I'm going to graph all three of those on the same, same screen. So let's put in, well, I already got x squared. Okay, let's put in 1 third x squared, and that is one way you can do it. It's the way I do it. And 2x squared. So we'll look at all three of those and see what, what that number in front does. So here's the original. Uh, the next one is going to be the 1 third. And the next one is going to be the 2. So what did changing that number do to the parabola? Yeah, I'm it Narrow it or wider? Yeah, so if you want to think about it horizontally, it either made it narrower or wider. What they usually do here is describe it vertically. So the red one, imagine you took the black one and it was like glued down in place right there and you pushed down on the sides. It would get wider. If you pulled up on the sides, and it was like stuck right down at the origin, it would get taller and skinnier. So we describe what that number does in front as either a vertical stretch, which makes it skinny, or a vertical compression, which would make it wider. Right? Think about like, like plate, right? If you squish it down, what's gonna happen? Spread it out. Right. So that's how we describe it. It's called a vertical stretch or Compression. Um, we do have to know which way does what. So the one third squished it. All right? We call that a vertical compression. Or we can say the graph shrinks vertically. The two, because this number is bigger than one, that causes a vertical stretch. Any questions on what yeah those numbers do? I'm confused, but something you said earlier. How come making um, x squared negative doesn't work with older? Because the negative was inside parentheses. If I put the negative outside parentheses, then it would look like this versus that. So where you put a negative can either cause a horizontal reflection and a vertical reflection. So technically, when I drew the red and the blue graph. They were mirror images of each other, but it's like doing a mirror image of like a capital T. Well, if you mirror image that, it looks exactly the same because the, it has a vertical line of symmetry. If I did a shape other than a parabola, then you could see a horizontal reflection and actually see something different. But I'd have to do a shape that's not symmetrical. Yeah. Now, the bigger you make the number, the more of a stretch you get. So if you graph 5x squared compared to 2x squared, 5x squared is going to stretch even more. 
it's going to look even skinnier. If you make this fraction 1 ninth x squared, that's going to be even more of a vertical compression, a vertical shrink. Right? So that's going to make it look wider. Now, let's try not only changing the number, but let's put a negative in front. Kind of already told you what it did in that last question. Um, but let's just try it. Okay. I, won't, I won't do all of them. Let's just do negative x squared. And let's do x squared. Big difference if you put the negative inside parentheses with the x and square it, or you put it out in front. Order of operations here, it's going to square the x first, because that's e for, for PEMDAS, and then it's going to multiply by negative 1. Versus if you put the negative inside the parentheses, when you square it, the negative gets canceled out, because the negative and the number are being squared, so it, it cancels. So you're going to see a difference in the graphs here, because the negative is outside. So that's the negative, and that's the one without the negative. So what kind of reflection would you say that is, if you had to describe it? Uh, yeah, no. A reflection over the x-axis. A reflection over the x-axis, exactly. So we call that um, either a vertical reflection, or you can say a reflection over the x-axis. Yep. So the negative causes the parabola to open downward. So in this kind of problem, what they're asking you to do is list the transformations. Well, if you look at this, and you look at that, there are two transformations that you need to do to turn this graph into that graph. The 5 is doing something, and then the negative is doing something else. And let's write them in that order. Can anybody tell me first, what is the 5 going to do to the graph? Yes, uh, Mia. It's going to stretch out vertically. Yep, so it's going to be a vertical stretch. And we just have to say how much. That's called a vertical stretch by 5. Or you can say by a factor of 5. So it's like 5 times it's stretched. So vertical stretch. A factor of 5. So you deal with the number first, then deal with the minus. What does the minus do? Yeah. Um, can you be more specific? Yeah, reflect. You could say vertical reflection, or you could say reflect over x axis. I usually say vertical reflection because it's shorter than writing reflect over the x-axis, but it means the same thing. I think that was it. Now, I'm going to discuss the order because I said let's write them in this order, but I don't know they're in that order. The order can make a difference. Like think of pem, uh, think of yeah, PEMDAS. The order that you do something in can result in a different answer. So there is a certain way you need to write these, and I will talk about that. Okay, adding a number onto the end of a quadratic. What do you think? Uh, I'll just do the x squared plus 2. So x squared, and then x squared plus 2. What do you think that plus 2 is going to do? Yep. Shift the vertex up to the so you think it's going to shift it up two units? Uh, I agree, it's going to be a shift. And there are two options, up and down and left and right. Well, let's see what happens. So there's your original. And here's the one that has been shifted up two units. So, yes, plus two would shift it up two units. Um, so let's write that down. So to get y equals x squared plus 2 from y equals x squared, you're going to shift up 2. 
That's okay, I'll let you create a right. Okay, the next one. To get y equals x squared minus 3 from y equals x squared, uh, you tell me. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah, Jake? Vertex brings down. Yeah, we're going to shift, and, and not just the vertex, shift everything. You got to shift, shift every point three units down. It's important when you describe a shift that you tell me direction and how much. Direction, how much. Don't just say shift two units. I don't know which way. And don't just say shift down. I still don't know which, how many. So a vertical shift is what we call a rigid motion transformation. This is different than a stretch. Rigid motion means it takes what you have and it just moves it somewhere else. It doesn't distort it. In general, if you have y equals x squared plus k, k can be two kinds of numbers. You can either have a positive number for k or you can have a negative number. If k is a positive number, that's going to shift you up. If k is a negative number, that's going to shift you down. Absolute value of k units. Why did I put absolute values around that? Why did I put absolute values? Is that what you did? Uh, up? The word, uh, where? Um, y equals x plus k. K? Yeah. It does not look like k. It doesn't? No. It looks exactly like a k. It does not. It's perfect. It, looks like it doesn't get better than that. It looks like a u. <laughs> That's a u. Are the only one who's seen that looks like you can go back to No, that looks like a k. It's just as good as I can do. That's a K for K. K. Okay. Okay. So if K is greater than zero, we go up. If K is less than zero, um, we shift down. And why, yeah, why did I put absolute values around the K? Someone was going to tell me. Yeah, uh, J. J. Right? Yeah, if you tell me I'm going to shift down negative two units, well, technically you're telling me to shift up, if you think of that as like a double negative. So don't say shift down negative units. Down is negative. You can go down five units. You can go up five units. But don't go up or down negative units. Uh, now, adding and subtracting again, but this time it's inside the parentheses. So let's do x minus 3 squared. What do you think the minus 3 is going to do? Move it to shift left to right. Okay, it is going to shift left to right. Which way? It's the opposite. It is. It's the opposite. So which way do you think this one's going to go? Gonna shift to the right. That's going to shift to the right. A lot of people say that one's going to go to the left. If you remember opposite, that's good. It's going to go to the right, three units. And you can tell just by looking at the vertex, it, it did go right three units. Okay, so I'm not going to write this one quite as formal as I did the last one. I'm just going to put right here, shifted right three. And how about this one? X plus two would be yep. shift left twice. Yep, would be shifted left two units. So somehow we got to remember it's the opposite. Okay. All horizontal transformations are the opposite of what you would expect. So horizontal shifts. Again, those are an example of a rigid motion transformation, meaning they do not cause any type of stretch. 
They just take what you have and move it somewhere else. Does everybody have the top part? So the way I try to think of it is if your problem is always x minus something, right? so if I see f of x equals x minus something, what I do is I look at what's in that box as long as it's written x minus. If what's in that box is a positive number, it shifts to the right. If what's in that box is a negative number, then it would shift to the left. And the reason I think of it that way is because then it helps me make more sense. Like I don't have to kind of think of it as the opposite, right? This is in front, the minus. So if you put a three in this box and you ignore the minus and just look at what comes after the minus, if it's a positive number, it would shift right. If you ignore the minus, that's the key, ignore the minus, and look at what's in that box. If what's in that box is a negative number, like that, it would shift left. And a lot of times, if you do have minus a minus, you would probably see it written that way. And that's why x plus 3 shifts to the left. However, however you can remember, all right? That's sometimes how I think of it. Think of the minus here. Ignore the x minus and just look at what's in the box. Positive number in the box goes right. Negative number goes left. So one thing that we are going to be asked to find is if we shift a graph, where is the vertex? Well, to find the vertex, all you have to do is figure out, did you shift left and right, or did you shift up and down? The vertex always starts at the origin. So if you shift something right two and up three, well, think if you were at the origin and you went right two and up three. Now your vertex is two, three. So you just have to see what your shift is. And there's only two numbers here that control the shift. Out of the A, the H, and the K, which two letters control the shift? I'm not worried about the stretch when I'm finding a vertex. Yeah. K, H, and K. H and K. H and K. And if you think of it exactly like that, the number in that box and the number in that box, exactly the way I made those boxes, h comma k is the vertex. Notice in the box here, I did not include the x minus. It's what came after the minus, and then whatever's on the end. Now, if you've got a parabola, line of symmetry, does it go horizontal or vertical? It goes vertical. So if I move the parabola down or I move it up, does that affect the line of symmetry? No. So moving up and down has nothing to do with the line of symmetry. Moving left and moving right does affect the line of symmetry. So when you want to find your line of symmetry, you can focus on even less all you have to do is focus on the H. That's what moves you left and right. Is there any question why shifting a parabola up and down has no effect on the line of symmetry? Again, I don't know if all of this is review. Um, did people do transformations like this last year or maybe even the year before? Okay. Then let's try this. What is 
my vertex going to be? And remember, be careful, because the way I taught you to think about the vertex, it's the number that comes after the minus sign. It's whatever would be in that box. So you may want to think of this one as what would have to be in that box. That's the value you need. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, so it would be negative two? Yep, this is a shift left two units, and then would be negative three? down three. Okay, my line of symmetry, well, we know it's vertical. And think back to what we did for the formula. X equals H. So imagine what would be in the box after the minus sign. And what number did we just did it with the vertex? Yeah, it would be negative two. Be negative two. So there's your vertex and line of symmetry for your pre uh, prep. Question on that? Okay, now, order matters. First of all, how many transformations do you think it would take to change that into that? Just two. Now, I'm gonna, before we do them, I'm going to put the next page up, which gives you the order. Yeah, you need the order first. There's your order. I'm not saying every single problem will have every single one of these. I'm just saying if they do, that's the order. First thing you always write down is any horizontal shifting. Then you write, technically you would do any horizontal stretching first. We're not studying horizontal stretching with parabolas though. That's why I didn't include it. But if you were going to write it, it would go right here. Um, so what it would look like, um, it, parabolas are not the best example to show you, but here's a square root function. A vertical stretch would look like this. A horizontal stretch would look like this. It's all where you put the number. But with, yeah, it's where you put the number. But we don't, we don't study them with parabolas. We could, but, but we don't. This is a vertical stretch. This is a horizontal stretch. Actually, technically, horizontal compression. You don't, you don't have to worry about that right now. So you do your horizontal shifting, then horizontal stretching. Then you go to your vertical stretch. Then you do any reflections if you have them. What's up? Oh, because technically, if you switch the order of two and three, it wouldn't make a difference. It's kind of like saying, if I took something and times it by three and then made it negative, or if I made it negative and then times it by three, I get the same thing. So technically, you can switch the order of two and three. Like, just, just do it that way. Um, so two and three, your vertical stretch, then your reflection. And the last thing you always write down is a vertical shift. So let's write our two transformations for this one. Um, do I have a horizontal shift? Yeah. So remember, a horizontal shift is going to look like adding or subtracting a number inside the parentheses. No, there's no horizontal shift there. Is there a vertical stretch or compression? Yeah, Jacob, what do, what do we have there? Uh, I think stretch. Yeah, that's a vertical stretch. Um, by how much? Uh, yeah, vertical stretch by factor of five. 
Uh, do we have a reflection? Corwin, what do you think? Do we have a reflection? Let's see. Um, I think so. Okay, what are we looking for that tells us there's a reflection? There's one thing you have to look for that tells us. It would be the negative, right? You'd be looking for a negative in front of the x squared. Yes. Do we have a negative in front of the x squared? No. No. So no reflection in this one. Um, how about a vertical shift? Do we have a vertical shift? Yeah. Uh, right. Yes. Yes. And what is it? How much? In which way? Up four units. Yep. You don't have to say vertical shift. Up four units. If you say shift up, I know that's vertical. Um, so you could just say ship up four units. Any question on that? Let's just describe uh, the transformations on this one. Okay, how many transformations uh, do you think we have here? No, not three. Yeah, Mia? Four. Yeah, there are four. This one has them all. So now just pretty much follow the order because you know you've got every one of them. What's the horizontal shift? Um, so what uh, what is it gonna do on the like on the screen? Shift, bring it to the right. Yep. So shift, right one. Okay. Um, how would we describe the vertical stretch? Yeah. Yep. So vertical stretch by factor of three. Now, the next part, uh, what tells me that there is a reflection over the x-axis? Yeah. The negative. Yep, the negative. That's right there. So reflect over x-axis. And lastly, what's my vertical shift? It's a shift up for you. Shift up for you. I have a question. Yeah. Um, why wouldn't we distribute the negative 3 into the x? Because when you have a problem the way I'm giving it to you, that is called standard form. In order to be able to figure out the stretch and the shift, you need to have it written in standard form. If it's not in standard form, you need to fix it so it is. And the first thing you'd have to do if you really wanted to do this out would be FOIL the x minus 1 and then distribute the negative 3. So let's say somebody did that. Let's say they FOILed out the x minus 1. That gives you x squared minus 2x plus 1. And then they distributed a negative 3 to that and added 4. So distribute a negative 3. Did I do that right? Yep. And now add 4. This problem right here, if you were to type it in on the calculator, is exactly the same as that problem right there. It's just been done out. The problem is when you do it out, you lose everything. You can't, and where's the shift up four? I don't even see a four in that whole thing. So you lost it. So we need to fix it so we can see it. So we have to change that back to that. Changing the way I did it is a lot easier. It's a foil and a distribute. To put it back the way it was, we have to complete the square. So I'm not going to really go through... Um, 
a whole big process on how to do it. I'm just going to show you an example. But the key is, whatever you do on one side, just make sure you do it on the other. Yeah. So let's try completing the square on that one. So 3x squared plus 12x minus 18. All right? It's like somebody took a problem like this, and they foiled it all out, distributed, combined like terms, and that messes us up. Okay. I can't tell you what the vertical stretch is, I can't tell you the shifting, and I can't tell you the stretching exactly, because I can't see it. So it's kind of like rewriting it in y equals mx plus b, so we can see it. Let me make what's on the right bigger. Okay. So, first step is to complete the square. Yeah. Okay, how do we complete the square? I have to remember. Okay, I remember. Ah, uh, so. We're going to write down the original problem. You don't have to do that, but I do. And then what you want to do is basically set it, I set it equal to zero. then you want the constant on the other side. Right? That's always the first thing you want to do. Get that constant on the other side. So now it's going to be, when you put it over on the left side, what is the constant going to be? 18. 18. Now, when you complete the square here, the goal is to factor it into something that's like x minus 3, x minus 3 x plus 5, x plus 5. Whatever you factor it into, you want it to be that thing twice. That's why there's an exponent of 2 on the parentheses. So it's like the same thing twice. In order to factor it, you need to make sure the coefficient of x squared is a 1. It cannot be a 3. So the way we do it, What do we call it if I take a 3 out of the right-hand side? Yeah? You divide both sides by 3. Uh, you're... So we're not going to divide it, but we're going we're gonna to kind of take it out of the term. There's a word for that. Yeah? Right, we're going to factor out a 3. And you can't just divide by it. You're going to see why in a second. questions up to there. Now, here is kind of where we do the magic completing the square. We have to add something on both sides. And remember, whatever you do on one side, you need to make sure you do on the other side. What you add here has to do with this number. You have to do two things to that number that are, unless you know what to do, you wouldn't guess it. Does anybody know the two things you have to do to that number. Yep. Yeah. yeah, you take half of it and then you square it. So what's half of this number? And then square it. Just a coincidence that that happened. So half of that number squared is 4. Now, we just added something on the right. To keep that balanced, we need to add something on the left. Actually, I should do it in this step right here. What do I need to add here to keep this balanced? Probably the 4, I think. No, not the 4. 4? No, we didn't add 4 on the right. 2 squared? Yeah. 12. 12. Why do you say to add 12? Because it's 3 times 4. Right. This 4 is inside parentheses with a 3 in front. So what you really added is a 12. 
That's the part that tricks people on completing the squares sometimes. When this number is a one to begin with, that little thing that just happened doesn't happen. Okay, so now on the left we have 30 equals, and if you did everything correctly, what's in those parentheses should factor very nicely. It needs to factor into two things that are the same, like x plus 1, x plus 1, x minus 5, x minus 5, some, something like that. Does anybody see what times what would give you what's in those parentheses? Uh, yeah, Joe? 2. What is it? x plus 2 times x plus 2. Now we're starting to see the vertical stretch, the horizontal shift, and kind of the vertical shift, but I need to put that back on the other side of it. So when I rewrite it, put the 30 back on the other side and set it back equal to y. So now you've got 3 x plus 2 squared minus 30. You can check if you did it right by putting that into a calculator, putting that into a calculator, and they should look exactly the same. If they don't, uh, you made a mistake. Now the transformations are very simple. What's the plus 2 going to do? Left 2. What's 3 going to do? Yeah. Stretch by factor of 3. And what's the minus 30 going to do? Shift down by 30. There wasn't a 30 in this original problem at all. I would have never known it was shifted down 30 unless I completed the square and check. That's how you complete the square. And I didn't write the transformations, but we at least set them. Any questions on that? Okay, so we're, we're in a pretty good spot. Um, that was the very last thing, so only one slide. Uh, one slide short, which I can finish tomorrow, and that'll take about a minute. So let me modify this a little bit. So we're not doing that. And let me fix, I might take the problem off the we're going to skip 44. And can someone remind me? I forgot the page on that. Was it 40? Oh, yeah. Oh, that one? 42. So it's 18 questions, it's like nine from each assignment, roughly. Okay, and we'll take a look at that tomorrow.